and Microsoft's authentic old technology has an offensive side that we can avail of. I am Ramon Pinuaga. I've been working for a long time in cybersecurity. I'm currently a pen tester at Prosegur, which is a, a Spanish security company. They also work on cybersecurity and they're actually investing a lot in this sector lately. I specialize in offensive security. And lately, I've been working on security in Windows environments. As Machiavelli would say, you need to know your enemy. And I'll talk about that today. So what is this talk about? I'm going to talk about authentic code, which is a Microsoft security technology regarding code signing, which is used as a basis for many other security technologies. We're going to see which technologies use authentic code and then we'll see how to make the most of its functionalities. Mainly from the offensive perspective to do evil things. Just a quick survey. Do you all know the authentic code term? Have you heard of it? Please raise your hand if you have. Just a few. And on a daily basis, I think that I guess that most of you, who you, most of you work on cybersecurity, but which of you have used authentic code or authentic code based technologies? I apologize for not being able to see properly the floor, but I guess that this little window is familiar to you. This is a smart screen windows alert. And the smart screen technology is based mostly on authentic code. So why is it interesting? Why did I start researching this topic? You may know that we've gone through a ransomware epidemic. Last year they said that in ransomware, the fraudsters had, won ten, had earned 10 million euros. It may be even more, according to black market. And now our customers are affected by this epidemic and they're requesting solutions for directed fishing or targeted fishing. So the aim is that we infect them first before the evil guys actually infect them. In these projects we've seen the corporations are very vulnerable. Their security tools have weaknesses that the bad guys avail of. And one of the technologies the bad guys know how to how to avoid is the smart screen and authentic code derived technologies. So that's the context. In this investigation, I'm I'm taking the role of the bad guy to try to avoid this technology protection. When I talk about the bad guys, I'm talking about the the legal pen testers, not the real bad guys. And well, let's go to the nitty gritty of things. What's authentic code? It's a Microsoft technology, a security technology for code signing. It allows us to sign a file. And when we talk about authentic code, we usually talk about signing binaries, exe files, and here we can also sign DLLs, MSI installers, skip our cell, UBS, and often I talk about signing bina binary or executable files, but when I talk about authentic code I refer to it in general. This in only allows us to sign a file to afterwards check its authenticity and to check who created it, as well as its integrity. The signing process, in broad terms, when we sign a, an email message, we calculate a summary a half of the text and we cipher it with a private key, uh, an RSA symmetrical 
key, for example. And authenticate is a similar technology. I get a file, I calculate the hash, a summary of it, and I sign it with a private key. The reliability mechanism of authenticate is similar to the SSL. There are root certification entities that can issue certificates with which I can sign files. When, when I talk about authenticode, you may not be familiar with the term, but if I talk about digital signatures, this may be more familiar. If you right-click on Windows on some executable files, within the properties menu, you may have seen the tab for digital signatures, and this authenticode technology online, this tab is authenticode. So when I right-click on a Windows file, if it's signed, I'll get this tab. If I don't get it, the file is not signed. Once within this tab, I can click on Properties. And I can look at the properties of the signature and the properties of the certificate signing. We have the counter signing, which is a time stamping. And regarding the PKI, just like in PKI, I have a time stamp uh, Time stamping server. And regarding authentic code, the signature time stamping is very, is very important. Apart from signing it, I calculate the request to, for time stamping server. And here the signature can be long lasting. I could sign a file without the time stamping, but that signature will only be valid while the certificate kit is in force. The authentic certificates expire in one or two years. So to avoid that expiration, I calculate time stamping and I add it to the signature and that signature will never expire. It will be indefinite. So why is authentic useful? It is the basis of many Microsoft security technologies and it's useful to verify software identity and leg legitimacy. I can check whether the signature is valid by checking the validity of the certificate. I can do that manually, but this is not useful to manually identify the identity. There are also other security technologies such as smart screen, which is a typical, a typical Windows alert that I get when I download something suspicious, and that technology validates the exe file signature automatically. It doesn't just allow me to identify the identity manually, but also automatically. Besides the function, of issuing, of seeing who issued a certain file, we can also use this for white listing protection which is a Windows systems protection strategy that prevents me from executing any file that is not specifically authorized. There are different solutions, such as commercial ones, even Windows has a couple of tools for whitelisting protection. And usually this whitelisting protection denies everything that is not allowed. It allows the execution of certain exit files so everything that is signed by Microsoft is usually allowed because Windows is Microsoft based. And these technologies usually use the authentic sig signature system. Another utility of the authentic code system is to guarantee that an exe file hasn't been manipulated. If I manipulate an exe file that has been signed, the hard the summary will change and the signature will be invalidated. So whenever I download a Microsoft update, an easy way to identify that it has been manipulated along the way is to verify that signature is valid. So these are some of the functionalities of authentic code in general. But mainly the main function of authentic code is to generate trust. When I download a Nexa file, that is not signed. 
if it's signed by Authenticode or by uh, Nature with a good reputation, the browser or Windows will give me the option to execute it directly. If the binary file is not signed or the reputation is not good enough, I will get this window to let me that the download may be dangerous. So Authenticode allows me to have an automated way to assess the reputation of an exe file. It will not tell me whether it's malicious, but it will assess its reputation. In fact, many advanced management mal malware and sandbox tools analyze authentic code signature of an exe file to give more or less reputation to the exe file. So eventually using the reputation of a binary file from a signature is something that is done very often. Why? Because nowadays I'd say that 99% of exe files that we download from the internet, from the legitimate editors, is already signed. It's quite weird to find otherwise. PuT is a very useful terminal tool and nowadays it's also signed. Most legitimate software is signed nowadays, so if I get something through the email that is not signed, I will not trust it, and it might be malicious, because legitimate software is malicious. That doesn't mean that everything that is signed is legitimate. Malicious software can also be signed. But at least I get a little measure, a little assessment of its reputation. Why? Because modern Windows, if I download something without signing it, I'll get the window, and everyone who distributes some somewhere, software will sign it for users to, to be trustworthy. So we've seen why authentic code is used for as a protection tool, but we're interested on the offensive side, how we can avail authentic code and the authentic code characteristics to do bad things, such as infecting a piece of equipment. The first thing we can do is, if the smart screen window is open, I can see when an exit file is not signed, and if I want to distribute a, mal a malware, I'll just sign it. And we'll see several options to sign malware to go through the smart screen. I can also use it for other aims if I want to hack or compromise a whitelisted and protected system, I can actually trick some whitelisting detection tools using recognized and, and legitimate exit files. And there may even be the possibility of adding a beacon to a file without invalidating its signature. We'll see this more in detail later on, but authentic code eventually is co-designing, so Windows, when it comes to validating the signature, may need to download information such as revocation lists. We can even sign an exe file so that we can force Windows to do an HTTP request every time an exe file is executed and make make sure we know every time the file is executed. I apologize. I had my phone on so that I could check the time. Regarding the smart screen, one of the technologies that is most often related to authentic code, that is the objective of of this is a smart screen. This is a, me a security mechanism integrated in the Windows systems that alerts me whenever a download may be dangerous. It alerts about the, the dangerous potential of the reputation of that download. That technology is integrated in Internet Explorer after version 8. In former versions there's something similar that is not called smart screen and this is also integrated in Windows 8. It's 
not a new technology and is based on an online reputation system. Every time I execute a binary file or a file downloaded from the internet, the first time I execute it, Windows invalidates its reputation. So it'll make a request to a Microsoft server to tell me whether the server has a good reputation. If the binary file is not signed, the reputation is calculated from its hash. And if the binary file is signed, the executable file reputation is calculated from the editor's reputation. So how does it work in broad terms? Whenever I download a file, the first time I execute it, Windows or Internet Explorer, depending on whatever I use, the first time I execute that file, Windows validates its reputation and will either show me the blue screen or let me go. If I use Internet Explorer, the actual browser will warn me, and if I use a different browser, the operating system will warn me. How does the OS know that the file comes from the Internet? Microsoft and Windows knows that because all popular browsers such as Firefox, Chrome and Opera, whenever they scan an Internet file, they add some metadata in an ADA's, ADS stream to indicate Windows that that file has been downloaded from the Internet. There are mail servers such as Outlook and other software that aren't those metadata. So Windows will warn me whether that file has no good reputation. If I download it through FTP or other tools, metadata are not added and a smart screen will not function. But regarding the usual tools users use, they do add metadata there and that activates a smart screen. So if I download something whose reputation is not good, I'll get this window alerting me that what I have downloaded may be dangerous. For example, if I'm doing a uh, target infection campaign, this window will make me lower the infection rate. And many users are quite rough and they just ignore the alert, they execute anyway, but here we are losing many infections. Even according to root policy, at Windows level I can force users not to ignore this alert. So if I set it up right, I can get users not to go through this and not execute unreliable software. Therefore, when it comes to doing a phishing campaign, I'm interested in not getting this window and we'll see the techniques available for that. I'm sure that you all have hacker friends who tell the usual story. Well, I generated a payload or an exit file with Mac exploit. I sent it to a colleague, I infected it, I took control over the, their equipment. Well, they need to renew those stories because this technology is 10 years old. Some people still have Windows XP or own browsers, but those people may be infected already. Therefore, nowadays, to infect a Windows system, we need to work a bit harder. Hey. And what's the validation like? As I was saying, the authentic code validation is done online, and here you have an example of how to do it. The first time you execute the exit, it's downloaded from internet, and, and you validate the reputation with a, a Microsoft, and you have the name of the file, the hash of the file, and then if it's signed, the name of the editor and the hash of the editor. And in the answer, it says whether it has reputation or not. In this case, it says, Hallowell, the file has reputation, so I will not get this alert window from Windows. So as we've said, we're doing a phishing campaign and want to infect people. And we send a link for them to download a file, an exit on the mail 
nowadays most email services do not allow you to to send access along. So we want to infect. We want that window not to come up. And in the phishing campaigns we've done for customers, I can say that if we use unsigned um, malware or fictitious malware, if we don't sign it, the effectiveness drops from 10 to 1. So the directed infection campaign or the phishing campaign really goes down in that case. So a goal, and the goal we had was to trick the smart screen. And some of you will say, since validation is online, I do mud in the middle, and I do uh, denial of service, and then I, the validation of the reputation, I, I can disrupt. That's partly valid, but if I do so, I will get the second window when I try to execute an exe. And I cannot connect to the micro to the Microsoft servers. I get this screen saying uh, we do not have access to smart screen, so it's still quite worrying. Not as worrying as the previous one that warns the user that it may be dangerous, but it, it sort of raises awareness. Or so doing denial of service is really not a solution. No, not a very reliable solution. So how can we trick smart screen? There are different strategies. Some are more analogic and some are more um, labor intensive. The easier option is to buy in, to buy a certificate and sign in our malware. Because just um, signing does not guarantee that we can go beyond the smart screen, although you it, it goes some length towards that, and that's the easiest solution. A second one would be to steal a certificate. And in fact, the, ma the malware families uh, that are more advanced tend to use uh, stolen certificates. The hack companies that publish uh, software, they steal their good reputation certificate, and they use that for signing. What other options have we got? Then we can move to more labor-intensive solutions to try to identify a binary, an existing binary that's reliable, that has been signed, and to modify it so that it executes our code. This is not always possible. And in fact, we are struggling against an electronic signature uh, system. So it's complex, but in some cases, we will see it is possible. And finally, if we're ready to work even harder, we can try to attack in a cryptographic way. As I've said, the base of uh, authenticoid is uh, authenticoid is a hash of the signed file, and I can try to generate uh, um, to to clone the signature. And we will see that it's difficult, but sometimes it's possible. So let's start with the easy part. Let's buy a certificate. We've done a couple of tests with two certificate um, entities that generate authentic code um, certificates to see how the process works and how safe it is. The first barrier is price. They're a bit more expensive than SSL certificates. They range between 180 to 100 euros. And, and in resale, you can get them cheaper. But for a ransomware distributor, this is, uh, this is just peanuts. We've done the validation process with some of these companies, and we've seen that they're not, the, the process is not too strict. It's quite automatic through email and web. Um, Prints. I'm not saying that it's easy to get a certificate uh, to the name of a Microsoft Corporation, but it's probably easy to get one to the name of uh, Danone uh, because it's uh, there are very few people who click on the right uh, hand side button to see um, what the name is. Uh, as. So as I was saying, just by sign a certificate does not guarantee um, reputation. 
but it gets me quite a long, quite a way along that. And what's the purchase process like? Well, I register with one of these companies that sells certificates. They ask for the name, the name of the company or the person who's asking for the certificate. Then they validate those data. Then finally, if the data are valid, they make an automatic phone call and they give me a PIN number. Um, and the data they ask for are corporate data that they get from business uh, databases. They are public data, so they're very easy to get. They're found in the so. I give them mm, data of a real company, and it will work. Interaction with the company, they send a couple of emails. But having an email from the company that I want to pretend I am, uh, it helps, but it's not actually necessary, because they don't actually check the email. The more difficult step is the phone call. Uh, because they ring the phone number, which is registered as the contact number of the company. But with a bit of social engineering, it's easy to argue that the, uh, the company has changed the phone on that um, they have a PX box, so they should ring another number, etc. So at the end, we can have a certificate to the name of an X company. And we can gain reputation that way. To gain, I haven't said earlier on that when a binary is not signed, the validation of the reputation is done from its hash. I can have a binary without signature that gains reputation if people um, just download it and do not report it as um, uh, malware. So in as soon as you have a number of downloads, it, it's reliable. And, and so without signature, it's very difficult to earn a reputation or if I use self-signed um, certificate. But with a legitimate uh, certificate, what I can do is I sign an exit that does nothing that's not uh, malware. I distribute it, people execute it, they will not report it as uh, malware, and it will give me reputation as an editor. And once I have a number of uh, software executions without anybody reporting it as a malware, then I, my certificate will have a good reputation. And whatever I sign with that certificate, um, from then on, will have good reputation, so I can sign malware. And it will sort of, and it will go beyond this reputation check. So that's the easiest way to do it. You can work harder, and you can use uh, certificates that already have a reputation. In one famous case, in 2012, somebody hacked the development servers of Adobe and, and stole the certificates and distributed malware with the Adobe signature. And that allowed them to do two, two things at the same time. The binaries that are distributed have a good uh, reputation because it's Adobe's reputation. And on top of that, if those I want to attack to have some uh, whitelist uh, protection system, they will probably have uh, Adobe as reliable. They will probably have that editor as an authorized editor. So they might actually, um, I might go beyond the protections based on, on white lists. You will think that it's illegal, so stealing certificates, and people that do APTs, APTs can can hack Adobe's, but uh, homemade is not so easy to do. But uh, that's not always the case. Sometimes it's as simple as doing Google hacking, because people sometimes leave their f signature certificates uh, all over the place. You can find them in GitHub or in Google. And, and within the app, there are people who sign, and they include the certificate within the package, and sometimes in leaks. 
regarding leaks, leaks a few years ago when they hacked hacking team, they published all of the tools and of the code and they published the uh, certificates of uh, uh, signature of hacking team. So you could actually sign your malware with their certificate that had a good reputation. And in fact, the the name was, the certificate was to hacking team SLR. So they didn't even hide their identity because very few people click the right hand side bottom. Having good reputation usually is enough to overcome the automatic validations. And there are lots of people who leave their private keys uh, all over the place uh, in a small search in GitHub uh, uh, files with this P12. Only with this extension, there are 1,780 files in GitHub. Not all of them have good reputation, but many of them are self-signed, which perhaps are not good enough to gain reputation, but many of them are certificates. And all the P12 have their own password. So sometimes we have to go beyond that password, but uh, typical password one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, are quite popular. So I cannot really get those uh, 1,700, but I can get a few. And uh, I can break into the password and just use it. So that's more on the analog side. But let's work a bit harder and try to overcome smart screen in a more like labor-intensive way. The techniques I'm going to show are not zero day. In the zero day, many have been discovered for a while, but the people who have discovered them have not taken an offensive attitude with this. And when I was doing research on this. I was thinking this uh, technique that uh, has been published can perhaps be used in a more aggressive way. And the first technique that we might find of interest in is modifying a reliable binary without changing the f signature. In theory, Authenticoid guarantees that the file cannot be modified. If I modify just one byte of the file that will change the hash and the signature will be invalidated, but thanks to the features of Authenticoid, not the whole code of the, the whole content of the file is used. So certain parts of the file that are not used for the signature can be modified. So when I sign the file, I take the starting file, I estimate the hash, and I add that signature at behind the X. And there are certain fields that when you add the signature change, and those parts of the file are not used to calculate the hash. And those are the ones that I can modify. And what happens? Well, precisely those parts are the ones connected with the signature. They contain no code. So initially, I cannot inject functional code, although we will see later on that sometimes we can do. So this is the, docu the official documentation of Microsoft about uh, authentic code. And the area in gray are those that are not used for the calculation of the hash, the headers, the everything that we see in white is used for the hash. So if I change it, I will invalidate the signature. So we can, I cannot touch the area in white. And if I want to inject code, that's the more uh, interesting part. If I want to. Uh, modify the code section, I will invalidate the, film, the signature. So to simplify, headers and sections are used for the hash. So if I touch them, I will invalidate the signature. What parts are not used to calculate the signature? Well, I have a checksum in headers. The checksum field, when you add the signature, will change. So it is not used to calculate the hash. 
and, and it's not very useful <coughs> in offensive terms. But, and then I have a header that points to security. Usually what we've called signature is actually, there's more data here. We have also the certificates that I used to sign for the signature to be validated, the signature itself and the timestamps. All of that is added behind the file, and when you add that, the header of security has to be changed. I have to change the size of this section because I'm introducing data and also the pointer to this area. So all of this part will not be used to calculate the hash, and I can modify. And you even add some extra padding at the end of the signature of the variable size. And here I can introduce data as well. And in this area, I can try to play to try to execute code. So how can we modify a binary without invalidating the, the signature? Well, I've mentioned that already. Everything in red I can use. The more obvious way is using the the padding part within the signature. And I, I can modify the header. I can say that the padding is whatever X bytes, and I can introduce information here. And because the padding is outside of the signed area, of the hash area, I can introduce whatever I want, and the signature will still be valid. So when the malware people started using this technique and introducing information, Microsoft tried to try to par to get a patch, uh, and they were going to be compulsory patches. But this uh, trick of introducing information there was using was being used by many software uh, legitimate software editors, and right now, so so. Microsoft took a step back and, and stopped preventing that, and, and therefore this option is still there. Another way of introducing data is behind the X itself. And that will not invalidate the signature. And because it's outside of the PE body, the, it's going to be non-valid data, but I can certainly introduce information there. And a third and more elegant option is to Within the certificate uh, table, I can introduce a dummy certificate, and within that certificate, I can keep some space for free text and, inf and introduce information there. And I can have the same exe, which is, has been signed and is valid, and I can introduce information there. And that is done, for instance, Google has a framework to do installations, which is called Google Omaha which is used to do the installer of the Chrome, and it allows me to introduce dummy certificates with information so that I can have an installer which I is signed, and I can introduce data there. I can do a personalized installer, for instance, uh, um, the user ID, etc. and I don't need to sign the, the exe again. So, so this would be the more elegant solution. And as a final option, uh, in the, in, I can modify that access so that the hash of the signed part does not change. Between collision attacks, I can do that. It's complex, but I could do it. So let's start with the collisions part. Why can I do collisions? Well. The beginning of the process, as I, as I was saying earlier on, is to calculate the hash of the signed part. An authentic code supports uh, hashes MD5, SHA1, and SHA256. The last one is used nowadays, but the other two are still valid. And Microsoft has a roadmap to retire these hashes, but they're still valid. And both of them have a, a collision problem. And there's the possibility that somebody can generate an exit based on a legitimate one by 
making the hashers match. I won't go into this part too much because I'm no expert in cryptography. But I want you to know that, as I was saying, MD5 still is allowed by Microsoft and binary sign by MD5 with authentic code are still valid and could be attacked by collision. And in 2009, Didier Steven managed to generate two X's with the same hash of the assigned area. And what he did was he could transfer the same signature from one to the other, to the other one, and both signatures were valid. He did the easy option. He controlled both executable A and B, generating a B executed, executed a legitimate Microsoft executable. It's more complex, but but with MD5, it would be possible to do it in a, in a sort of viable way. I have a number of demos, but since we're running late, perhaps I can leave them for the end. I can't see what you're telling. So I'll show you more slides, and at the end, if we have time, I will do the demos. Just for you to see that, for instance, in this case, that the MD5 signature is still valid. So as I was saying, I can modify an exe if I manage to do that, and the hash matches. I can uh, transfer the, f the signature, and it will still be valid. But it's quite complex. And an easier option is uh, code injection in the areas that are not signed that are not used for the signature so that the signature will not be made in ballot. When I did the research for this part, I thought this is, this is a boring. Nobody's going to find this interesting. But precisely in the last black hat of the United States, there was a talk about this, how to inject code in a signed file uh, with authentic code without invalidating the, firma, the signature. So somebody has done the work already. And I looked at the video, and there was a trick, because they were, these people were injecting code in the padding part uh, with the malware. But to launch that malware, it was using a second exe that acted as a loader, and they loaded that into the memory. OK, it's OK to be able to introduce malware in a legitimate file, but but you could have introduced it in a txt. And what's actually work is using the external loader. So that's not a very practical uh, solution, because you have to upload the loader uh, to the machine. But in 2013, there were people who managed to execute code, modifying only the part that you can modify. And how can this be done? There are software editors, for instance, that when it comes to distributing an installer, they generate an installer, but they don't want to uh, every to have to sign every time there is a change in what you've installed. So they do a generic installer that they sign. And then in the padding part, or at the back of the file, they introduce whatever they are installing, the fit or whatever. And they, I introduce that in the non-sign part, so I can change the version of what I'm installing, and the installer remains. And because what I install is on the unsigned part, nothing prevents me from changing that and installing rather than the original call, something, something else. So I looked in the internet, files that met these uh, conditions, executable files that had a valid signature, but that loaded, uh, they had a payload from the non-signed area. And I found two different types of cases. There were installers who did a payload from the non-signed area, in the padding area, for instance. 
that unsigned part can be could, could be modified and there were other installants who didn't have the payload there but they did they loaded it in a non-secure way from the web with an HTTP. So if I'm doing a man-in-the-middle attack, I can do that uh, hijack of that payload and from there execute that code from a legitimate sign uh, X, X, file, X file. And another option is there were installers that were signed, but the routine was that within the exe body they looked for anything that looked like a zip, for instance, and the installer at the end had the installation code, and then they introduced several zips inside, and all of that was signed. So the zip inside could not be modified. But if I annexed a zip at the end of the file, the code that decompressed and installed, it, it, it um, decompressed what I, everything, the original files, and what I had um, added, and then installed everything. In that way, I can use legitimate software to be able to execute code, which initially the software editor didn't have in mind. This is an example of what it, it would look like. Uh, this is a tool that allows you to see information of the a code signatures of a PE. And at the top, you have a normal file that has a signature PKCS7. And after the signature, it says bytes after the signature four. And bytes that are not uh, zero uh, is zero. How much time have I got? And this is a normal file. However, here we find a vulnerable file. It has a signature. But after the signature, it says 1,024 bytes that are not down to zero. And that means that the editor has, uh, of that software has introduced information. And because it's not mm, signed, I can modify it to do malicious activity. And I just want to show you briefly. Um, I was going to, to upload the demos in YouTube. So if I don't have time for you to see them, I, I, you can find them there. This is a vulnerable file. I have several of them. For instance, this one, which is a legitimate file. If I go to the headers, the header I'm interested in is the security header. This is a normal file with a normal code signature. And the structure of the signature part is, first of all, certificates then the signature, and then the timestamps. Like here it says Symantec, timestamping service. And the signature, as you can see, has nothing behind. But if I look at the vulnerable file, for instance, a Wi-Fi installer. If I go to the headers, I look at the security one, and I see the same structure. First of all, the certificates. Authority one, then the signature, and then time something for the global sign. But if we look closely, all of a sudden we get to the end of signature, and I have loads of bytes in zero, and I see a Nazi code. And here I see another parameter saying download URL, and we get an FSI file downloaded from FTP. So if I'm doing a man in middle attack, I could swap it. And this part is, is not signed. Instead of downloading an MSI from a legitimate, legitimate website, I could download it from my own website. But it's even worse. If I keep going down, there's HTML code. And this all the, in the unsigned area. I could modify that without bearing the app. The ex exa file. There's a lot of HTML code, which is this one. If I execute the installer, the WinZip installer, I 
get a few screenshots with the HTML code. Here in the installer I see the HTML code and I can modify all, all this to install the MSI I want and show the screens I want. And the signature will keep being valid, you can still have the same reputation. And if in the organization they have a wild control list per signature, a wild list control per signature, you can actually skip the wild lists. If I have the time, I'll show you how I modified it. So if I can modify an X file, that loads code or downloads code from a URL in the outside area, I can actually manipulate it. Here's an example, and as I said, after the signature, here we have another installer, and what we what is downloaded here is a cotometi launcher.exe. This is a go to meeting installer that in the on site area has the URL of the exe downloaded and installed in the equipment. I can modify this information and ask for the download of a malicious exe file and install it. After a legitimate installer, I can execute an exe, an exe file. And if I have the time, I'll do some demo. So, I managed to get my main aim, which is to skip this smart screen window. But this is useful not only to trick smart screen, but also to trick other technologies and to bypass other authentic technologies. White list and protection tools are increasingly popular and they allow me to execute only the programs I choose. But the configuration is here so to see which exe files I can execute and I define a secure route. I can load different things from a hash or from a trusted editor. Eventually, in a very large organization, I have thousands of exe files, so controlling one by one or hash by hash is very difficult. Every time there is a patch, the hash changes. The whitelisting solutions usually use code signatures. And I can configure the equipment a certification entity internal from the company if I want to, uh, to authorize a certain exe file. I sign it with that certificate and I distribute it. What happens though, in most of these structures, the most popular installers are there, such as Microsoft Adobe Inter, Adobe and Intel. So if I find an exe file signed by one of these trusted entities, it allows me to execute malicious code and carry out certain tasks. I can use it to bypass the whitelisting protection. So, Windows has a couple of tools to do whitelisting configuration. I have the RSP, the Software Restriction Policies, and these are based on the same concept to verify that the editor is trustworthy. There are more, but the usual X Exe files used for this are these ones. They're all signed by Microsoft. So if the organization authorizes Microsoft as a trusted editor, because all the Windows software belongs to Microsoft, I can use these programs to execute code that I wouldn't be able to execute initially. So I have a couple of demos I have had the time to do. To show in one of them, I executed a PowerShell code with an MS build, and here I can execute PowerShell code. So, even though PowerShell may be forbidden, I can execute the code. And I have another demo, and here by using the VGInfo tool, I can execute the VBS code, Visual Basic code within a Microsoft tool to bypass the whitelist. 
I'm just about to finish, and this technique here is used whenever I have an update system to validate that the downloaded update is legitimate. I validate that it has been signed by Microsoft. In the case of Microsoft our update. So a few years ago the contact is people saw that the Microsoft updates could be replaced whenever the WSUS use uses HTTP. So WSUS to distribute the configuration of the updates distribute some HTML files that are in HTTP so they can be manipulated and above we have a legitimate update so the team validates that this comes from Microsoft by validating its authentic signature what do they do? they swap the XML this is the malicious update and instead of selling an update exe file, they send a different exe file with the parameters they want in this case to open a calc so I get the Microsoft update validation and I get that check ok we're just about to finish and one last function of Authenticode is setting a tag or a beacon in any file assigned by Authenticode, for example an exe file. Which concept? I don't know that you know honey docs or honey tags. These are tools that allow you to have a small image. And every time you open that file there's a URL connection and I know that that will be open. With Authenticode I can sign an exe file and configure some URL so that whenever someone ex executes that exit there will be a URL and I know that someone did execute that exit file. It can be used as a trap and if someone executes it I know that it's been compromised. The good thing about Authenticode is apart from having a beacon or a tag I can do more than exit files. I can do it in binaries, drivers, collections, containers, scripts, powershells, click once applications, and I can insert authentic code signatures and look at them. So here's a demo of a file signed with a false certificate. And whenever this exe file is executed, there is an HTTP call, and I can actually see when that exe file is executed, I don't have the time to show the demo, so I'll post them on YouTube, but these are the conclusions. Authenticode is a tool that allows us to manage security in a very granular way and to validate that the binary files have not been manipulated regarding the whitelist. It allows me to manage the whitelist in a very comfortable way, but it does have certain weaknesses that can avail of to do bad things. And well, every tool has a dark side. I don't know that there is any time for questions. Well, we're quite tight on time. We just have time for one question. Are there any questions from the floor? Right here? Okay. I'll just go get you the microphone. Could you please stand up? Well, congratulations for the presentation. I just have one question. You approach this from the offensive perspective, but in your experience, which are the recommendations when it comes to using authentic code? so that we don't have those weaknesses. I understand that one of them would be not using the fields that are not included in the signature. And I just want you to know in general what's your perspective on this. Well, general is quite interesting because it allows me to validate the trusted address but not trust an age or binding. The fact that this is signed by Microsoft doesn't mean they cannot be used to do evil things. I can use a whitelist with a second blacklist that deactivates other things. Such as the Microsoft binaries, they can do evil things. If I in field variations, Authenticode allows me to validate the signature but not certain fields.
So you need to work harder on that. Well, thank you very much, Ramon. It's been extremely interesting and very in vogue. Thank you very much.